Yesterday, we had a chance to talk to about 1,200 students because I think they're, they're in approaching a world that doesn't think much anymore of Christianity. Maybe that's not how we see it at this age, but I think it is how a lot of high schoolers see it because they're being approached by people who do not think that Christianity is good anymore. And instead, they think it's the source of all racism, misogyny, homophobia, all those things that they would say they reject, they think they're caused now by our Christian faith. And I think our high schoolers are hearing it every day. So we wanted to be able to help them. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, and transition to our presentation this morning. Because the real question is, is, does Jesus really matter? Is he really good? Is Christianity really beautiful? We just spent time talking about it and singing about it. But is it true? I didn't think it was true. I didn't become a Christian until I was 35. In Los Angeles, it's not hard to grow up and not. So I'm just going to ask you to leave this on the screen. Here we go. You ready? We're going to be drinking water out of a fire hose. Now look, we just talked about singing. We just sang hymns together. And so you'll see that this scripture in Matthew 26 talks about how Jesus, in fact, actually sang a hymn at the Lord's Supper, right? And we've been singing hymns ever since. As a matter of fact, Revelation tells us that we're going to be singing in the new heaven and the new earth. It says it over and over again. They sang a new song. Again, they sang a new song, different passage. Again, they sang a new song, different passage. Why are we singing about this if it isn't beautiful to begin with? That's what I want to talk about this morning. Now, I will tell you that I was um, basically um, uh, raised in California where you don't really know. I, my whole career, most of it was spent working murders. Those are pretty horrific things. And so I, I, my career is basically driven by cold case murders. I solve cold cases. Uh, most of my stuff has been on on Dateline. So if you like Dateline, you've probably seen some of our cases. And you learn a lot working cold cases. And I actually applied what I learned as a detective to examining the claims of the New Testament. You know, we, we actually examined those authors as though they are eyewitnesses. If they are eyewitnesses, I ought to be able to test them like I would test an eyewitness in a criminal trial. Well, that's how I became a Christian. And I was 35 at the time. My kids were young. My son, Jimmy, who is now in the same job doing the same thing. He's, he's you know, doing um, uh, law enforcement. He's a detective himself. Like he's been doing this for a number of years now. And, and he has my name. We're not very clever people. We use the same name over and over again. So I gave him my uniforms because that's the uniform that I wore. Back, by the way, if you wanted to get hired in Los Angeles County, you had to have a mustache like that, okay? <laughs> that's, that's how that worked. And I got my uniforms from my dad. My dad was named Jim Wallace at the same agency. He started in 1961. I was born in my dad's academy. Jimmy was born in my academy. And so we've been at the same agency with the same name, doing the same job for 61 years. And if you call there today and ask for Jim Wallace, there's still somebody there to answer the phone. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, my dad's in northeast Texas. If you go down toward Mount Pleasant and just drive about 30 miles south of that. That's where he lives. He was born and raised there. He came out to California to work for career. And he went right back as soon as he was done because we love this part of the world. As a matter of fact, I love it because I was here a number of years ago to do a, a six-minute scene in a, a movie called God's Not Dead 2. We filmed it in Little Rock. And so this is, we had six minutes to make a case, evidentially, for why we believe the Gospels are true. Well, that's what I want to be able to help you do. But it turns out you need to know a lot more than six minutes of information to make a six-minute case. So we're just going to dive as deeply as we can in a weird, weird way. All right? So you probably have never examined uh, cold cases as part of your Sunday morning services, but we're going to be doing that today. And it's from a book I wrote called Person of Interest. I, I'll just tell you, I tell everybody who writes books, if you want to write books, it's easy to write a book. The hard part is getting somebody to read it. Okay? And, and I don't like having to sell books. So I'm going to send you a bunch of free stuff at the end today. You do not need to buy a book. But if you want to, I'm happy to sign one for you. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to speak to 1,200 high schoolers to help them make a case for why this is true so they will stand tall in turbulent times. That's the goal. But I'm just glad to be with you guys this morning. Now, what we're going to do is look at a kind of a weird thought experiment. I want you to imagine a world in which somehow they have successfully destroyed 
every single New Testament document. Imagine some world in the future where they've gathered everyone, so no one's even got one hidden anywhere. They have found and destroyed every single New Testament and every single manuscript leading to the New Testament. Could they erase Jesus from our collective memories just based on the destruction of our manuscript evidence? That's what I want to discuss, because it turns out that if they can't, it tells us something about Jesus. Now, I've worked a bunch of cases where you get there and there's a dead body at the scene and you've got material evidence and so you've got a crime scene and you can even put a tape around the crime scene and you can work the evidence that's in the crime scene. But that isn't always the case. Sometimes you get, I've got cases where I've got nothing in a crime scene. I mean zero, because this dude killed his wife and then told police that she ran off. And they took a missing persons report. Meanwhile, he's effectively destroyed the body or hidden the body, and we never find it. And 30 years later, I get the case, and now I've got a case where I've got a missing persons report, but no one even took photographs of the crime scene. So I've got nothing in the crime scene. Now, I might suspect that a husband did it, but I gotta make, how do I demonstrate that he's really a person of interest if the crime scene is empty? You know, he sold the house, it got remodeled three times. I mean, it's like there's nothing even to look at. And there's no body. These are called no-body murders. I've done a number of these, a couple of more on Dateline. And I'll tell you that um, if you look at how to do these cases, in front of a jury, you have to explain to jurors that all crimes occur as part of a sequence in time. There's a period of time before the crime, and there's a period of time after the crime. Make sense so far? Okay. So how do we demonstrate what happened on the day of the murder? Well, I always say if it was a, a murder and not just a person who ran off, that was an explosive day. That was a day in which he did something he shouldn't have done. And it was like a bomb went off. Well, every bomb has a fuse that burns slowly until the bomb explodes. You know, tensions rise between him and his wife. He's preparing to all the materials he needs to get rid of her. And this thing burns toward the actual day of the event. He does this terrible thing. And now you've got shrapnel and debris all over the blast radius. That's what happens with bombs. Well, it turns out that if I wasn't sure what happened on the day, I could demonstrate it really by just examining the fuse leading up and the fallout that occurs afterwards. So I call these fuse and fallout cases. We just make a case from the fuse and fallout to demonstrate we've got a felony. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so and I do this in criminal trials, I actually build them this way. So um, I have a weird background. Uh, my, I wasn't always a cop. I wasn't thinking I was going to be a cop. I got my bachelor's degree in design in the arts, and then I got a master's degree in architecture at UCLA, and I was working as an architect when I finally decided to follow my dad's footsteps. So I ended up coming over from architecture to law enforcement, which is a weird path to... But here's how it worked out for me, is that then when I was doing, doing jury trials in some of the most difficult cases in Los Angeles County, we just, I just helped them, for example, with their closing argument in the Robert Durst case, which is a famous case in Los Angeles that we settled last summer. Um, I, I'm able to use my art background to build case uh, presentations. So if I was going to do this in front of a jury trial, it would kind of look like this, where you would have the series of events that lead to her disappearance, and I would make sure that we go through that with the jury, and then you would have all of the fallout that occurs afterwards that demonstrate that he's, he's guilty. Does that make sense? This is how it looks like. This is what it looks like in front of a jury. But when I was looking for the first time at 35, not raised in the church, no one in my family is a Christian, had no idea, stepped into a church for the first time other than like for, for a funeral with my wife, a huge mega church, had about 18,000 people. And I thought it was a joke, just a big performance. But the pastor did say that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived. And that provoked me to buy a Bible. And then I started examining the accounts. And one of the things I had to do is ask the question, is there a fuse and fallout? If I didn't trust the New Testament, or if every New Testament had been destroyed, was there enough evidence outside the New Testament to demonstrate that Jesus is who he said he was? And the only way you would know that is from fuse and fallout. So I just built a case from the fuse and the fallout. Well, this is what it kind of looks like in this book I wrote called Person of Interest. This is book number eight in a series of books that looks at the evidence for Christianity. Now today, all I'm going to talk to you about is the songs we've been singing, the art that's been produced, the way that Jesus has impacted our collective imagination. 
We're just going to talk about that one piece. Because believe it or not, there's evidence in that piece. Um, let me just change our scenario slightly. Let's just look at Jesus in this blast radius. We'll turn it into a timeline. And I'm going to start looking at early history. I'll put things in the timeline based on where they fall in history. So the earliest history will be at the 1 o'clock. The later history will be at 11 o'clock. Make sense so far? So if I was looking at the art that is produced by, as a result of Jesus, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of art early in history. And the reason why I wouldn't expect to see a lot of art early in history is because there aren't that many Christians early in the first common era in the first century. They're being persecuted, chased, they're hiding. They don't have any patrons with the protection that patrons offer, which is really behind a lot of art. Patrons are really what drive art. And there aren't a lot of these in the first century. So I wouldn't expect to see too much in the arts in the first century. But the reality of it is that we really do see a lot in the arts in the first century. Even the earliest um, Christians were not afraid to produce art. And so you'll see in antiquity some of the earliest, and some of these are not even by Christians. There are people who are mocking Christians. Some of the earliest art, perhaps the earliest art we have of Christianity is somebody who is mocking Christianity and drawing Jesus as a donkey on the cross. But we do have early art. And the reason why I think we have early art, even though people were dying, if they caught them as, as Christians, they didn't care. <laughs> what are they going to do? Are going to kill us? Some of the earliest church fathers put it this way. Justin Martyr says, well, they can kill us, but they can't do us any real harm. And that's true. And so they continue to do the art. And so you'll see that it starts to become a driver. That the imagination that Jesus initiates in the arts is staggering. So you'll see that in the dark ages, allegedly, we still call those the dark ages. I think scholars are moving away from that term. I hear them calling it the early middle ages. Why? Because they're not that dark. They're not as dark as you might think they are, especially in the arts. Because Christians, some of the most famous images that you associate with Christianity are coming out of the dark ages. Dark ages. And if you look at the Middle Ages and turn that corner and head toward the Renaissance, you start to see an explosion in the arts driven by the inspiration of Jesus of Nazareth. Some of the stuff that you think of as you, you might be familiar with. Now look, I, I have a background in art history, so I love this kind of stuff. And if you don't, tough, you're stuck with me today. Okay? But as I look at how art has progressed over the years, I recognize that Jesus has an unusually high role to play in it. It's not just in the West either. Yes, it is in the West, but if you look at that, this is the modern era. It hasn't stopped. But if you do an A to Z examination of the entire world, this is shift to the entire world, you will find that Jesus is not uniquely inspiring just in the West. Jesus has inspired artists all over the world. And when he does inspire those artists all over the world, they have a tendency to contextualize him, to make Jesus their own, because Jesus is the Savior of all of us. So if you look at Jesus, for example, in South America, he looks distinctly Catholic. But if you look at Jesus, let's say, in Kenya, he looks very different. Or in Papua New Guinea. Or in South Africa. It just depends on where you are. He has a different appearance depending on where you are. He is the absolute most inspirational figure in the entire history of art. Not just in the West in every nation of the world. And I'm not overstating that. I want you to remember that Jesus doesn't come first in terms of inspirational characters. He's in a line of other deities, mythologies, whatever, that preceded him, none of which have inspired the arts like Jesus of Nazareth. He comes after all these folks, and they don't inspire. As a matter of fact, it's, it, they don't have any inspiration on in the arts much at all. I'll show you why in a second. It's Jesus who inspires. And I, and I want you to think about that for a minute. As a matter of fact, it's not that Jesus inspires. He leaves evidence, fingerprints. Let me give you an example of this. So I went through every passage of Scripture, and I, I focused on the Gospel of Mark. You know why? Because Mark is shorter than every other Gospel. This is a lot of work, okay? But I just went, this is the Gutenberg Bible of every passage. Now, this is the important, if you look at the uh, Gospels, and you break them into episodes, scenes, these are the scenes from Mark. And so it starts with the baptism of Mark at the top. It ends with the resurrection of Jesus, the baptism of, of, John, of Jesus, and then the uh, resurrection at the end. So this is every episode in the Gospel of Mark, in order. 
Well, it turns out you could reconstruct every episode of the Gospel of Mark in order just from the art that's developed before the Dark Ages. And there it is. You'd have to destroy more than the New Testament to erase the story of Jesus because you have to destroy every surface on which this art is painted, sculpted, etched, or drawn. That's a lot of destruction in order to get rid of Jesus. And this is true for every gospel. So the question is basically this. Who in the world is documented this well? Other than Jesus of Nazareth. I just throw that out as a challenge. I already know the answer. Nobody. And this is after just three years in public ministry. He is more well documented than any other historical figure. That's just a fact, folks. And it's not just that. It, and I'm going to give you everybody else who lived contemporaneously with Jesus. These are the other people who could have been. Look, we're calling this the first century for some reason. You, by the way, it's not the first century. There's a bunch of centuries before the first century. We're calling it the first century because something happened in the first century. And all of these people who were contemporaries internationally, globally with Jesus, had zero impact on history like Jesus. And especially zero, and this is just one aspect, I'm just talking about the arts. And it's not just um, in antiquity. And it's not just in one genre. So if you know anything about your art history, it turns out that art history is broken into genres in periods of time. Isms, right? So you'll go through Impressionism and Expressionism and Symbolism and Dadaism and Popism all the way into contemporary times. Every ism in which artists have worked is dominated by Jesus of Nazareth. Here's how you could test that. Simply look at every ism. I had research assistants for this because this is going to be a lot of work I knew. So I uh, had a couple of guys help me with this. But just look at every genre of art. Google the top three or just search online, search in books for the top three artists in every genre and then look at their catalog. Every single one has an image somewhere in it of Jesus of Nazareth. This cannot be said for any other historical figure. What in the world? These are people who are, a lot of them don't, you think Andy Warhol gives a lick about Jesus? I don't think so. But he's got him illustrated. Why? Well, it's every historic period, it's every genre, it's every style, it's every means. There's something about Jesus that provokes people to... And it's every master, so I'll just, here's some of the master's names here. I don't know how many of you actually like the arts or give a lick about the arts, but there's a bunch of artists who are kind of known as the artists of history. And I've got a list of them here. Do you recognize any of these people? Maybe not. I don't know if you do or not. I'll, I'll just take out the ones that are lesser known and I'll leave the big ones, okay? Now look, I know like high schoolers, they know some of these people. Because some of these folks are the Teenage Mutant, uh, Mutant Ninja Turtles right there, okay? So they, and they, they actually know the colors to which they belong, okay? But it turns out that the arts are dominated by people who drew all of these folks. All of these folks I mentioned, all of them have illustrated Jesus in some way. He is not just the most inspiring figure in the West. He's the most inspiring figure globally in every genre. Why? Because he provokes. He informs. He irritates you. He, he inspires you. Whatever he's doing, it's doing. Now, and also, when you see him painted, he is painted very differently for a reason. So, for example, if you compare the Buddha and how the Buddha is presented internationally, he is almost always presented as the exact same ethnic person sitting in the same position. He doesn't change much in the way he's presented, even though the texts show that Buddha's not always sitting like this. But it could, I don't care where you are, if you look at him in Brazil and compare him to Japan and compare him to South Africa, he looks like he's been painted or sculpted in the exact same place. This is not true for Jesus. Jesus looks very different based on contextualization because every people group sees him as their savior, and that means he is represented in their ethnicity in the style at which they do art at the time. He's contextualized in a way that's different than, say, Buddha. And that's why I think he becomes a much more inspirational figure, because he can be interpreted this way, artistically. Does that make sense? This is why I think he has inspired so much art globally, and not just, of course, in the West. All right, so here's my question for you. Is it just art? I start off talking about how we're singing in church. Why are we singing in church? This is the one place culturally where people get together every week and someone sings from a stage to an audience. 
Would you be surprised in that we dominate music? Yeah, we have a culture of music, which is very unusual. It starts really early. Do you, uh, this is a, a classic worship service. So maybe the next service, the contemporary worship service, are probably familiar with this guy. This is Chris Tomlin. And he wrote this, book, this song called Forever. And a lot of people will sing forever. It's been around for what now, probably 15, 16 years. I forget how old it is. But of course, he didn't write that song. He wrote the song, but he got it from David, who was part of a psalm. He's just basically recrafting Psalm 118. Because we have been singing this song for thousands of years. Because we are in a worldview that is dominated by the arts and music. As a matter of fact, scholars think this is the song that Jesus is singing at the Lord's Supper when he does sings a hymn before they go out to the Mount of Olives. So I want you just to think about the impact that, why would you be surprised? There's lots of other songs that I think you'll see in Scripture. Like there are scholars who will think that there are passages in the Scripture of the New Testament that are either creedal or songs that have been sung or sung in order for us to memorize certain theological truths. So you'll see different kinds of songs that have very much appear to be a psalm, but they're actually passages of Scripture, like in First Timothy, or like this one uh, in First uh, Peter. So you'll see that we have a song tradition that's actually in Scripture. We're not only commanded to sing from Scripture, there's a history from Judaism to Christianity. There are also examples of songs in Scripture. So if we were to go back to that Gutenberg Bible and look at the Gospel of Mark, for example, and I said, okay, you know, what can I reconstruct from music? If you lost all of the scriptures, all of the New Testament, plus they destroyed every piece of art. Well, it wouldn't matter because you can still reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the songs sung in the first three centuries of the common era. Because these are the songs that actually reiterated the story of Jesus. I'm going to give you the list. These are hymns that are very ancient, some of which we still sing in church. We've been singing these songs for 2,000 years. And those songs, from those songs, you can reconstruct everything you need to know about Jesus from his birth. This is from the songs now. Just from the songs we sing, you can reconstruct all of this data. Everything about his birth, his ministry, his mission, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his return to judge the living from the dead, the titles we use. All of this you can reconstruct not from the New Testament, just, just from music. And of course, there's so much rich theology in the hymns, you can reconstruct so much of his nature as well. So let me go back to this um, period of time. Uh, just like there are periods of time in art history, there are also genre periods of time in music history. I just want to show them to you. This is the history of music. I remember when I was first was watching you guys, I thought, man, this is cool. Your bass player, I thought it was a Rickenbacker. It's a Hofner. That's a cool bass, right? I'm just geeked out on music too. I was on worship teams for years and years. And the history of music will tell you something interesting. It's dominated by Christians creating music largely for the church that then became the music of the world. It's, we dominate music. It's not just that we dominate them in terms of Christ followers. Every period is dominated because we are creating the structure of music we know today. There, there were, these things did not exist until Christians. You realize that we would write down the words like of David's psalm and we would transfer those to each other. But what, how's, what's the melody like? Well, the melody was being just passed person to person until a Christian invented musical notation. We are reading music today because a Christian invented that process. As a matter of fact, we invented harmonization. We invented the major and minor scales. We invented most of the, music, uh, the instruments we're playing today. Those were created by Christians. The entire structure of music is, is dominated by Christ followers. And why? Because they are crafting music for the church. So what was it young people are listening to? I told them yesterday, whatever you're listening to, it's indebted to a Christian. Because the attributes of the music they're listening to, if it's country or pop or hip hop or whatever it may be, I don't care what genre it is, this is what it's leaning on. It's standing on these innovations that all forms of music actually share. But where do those come from? Those came from the history of Christianity. And as each person invented it, it eventually coalesces into what we call music today. This is entirely Christian history dependent. So I asked them, what are you listening to? I mean, some of these folks are listening to Christian music artists. 
like listen to like contemporary Christian music. Do you realize there's an entire industry of just Christian artists that have, are selling millions of albums, mostly out of Nashville? <laughs> I don't care even the genre, whatever genre is, it's probably being recorded in Nashville. And, and it's, it, it's, it's great, but okay, I, I know, I get it. You don't like Christian music, right? I only would count secular music. Okay, so I did a little search. IMDB, Rolling Stone Magazine, and Billboard. I looked for every Christian, I mean, every, uh, what are the top, like, 100 secular music acts in the last 100 years? Well, this is the list. I thought, what are the odds? So we searched the catalog of all of these artists. All but two have sung repeatedly about Jesus of Nazareth. And these aren't believers. As a matter of fact, some of these are quite vile. My favorite on the entire list is Frank Zappa's Jesus Thinks You're a Jerk. That's my favorite song on the entire list, okay? It's because, again, Jesus is one of those figures that either irritates you, inspires you, infuriates you, whatever the reason may be. You're singing about Jesus the same way you're illustrating Jesus because he matters. We started off talking about this, um, this, 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 this um, template for doing fuse and fallout, how we use them in criminal trials. Now we kind of flipped it to this template for Jesus. I want to end where we started. This idea of a fallout, we talked about just one piece of this. We talked about the imagination. You can tell I'm a good Baptist because I ended every word the same way. Did you notice that? A-T-I-O-N. Okay, you've got to be a Baptist to do that, I'm going to tell you right now. It either has to start with the same letter or in the same way. But it's not just music. No one has been written about more than Jesus of Nazareth. More screenplays have told the Jesus story than any other historical figure. The most, the most widely viewed movie in the history of movies is still the Jesus film. Um, no one has impacted screenplays or literature. You can reconstruct the entire story of Jesus from non-Christian sources in the first three centuries. That's the impact he has had on literature. Um, it's not just that, it's science too. Did you realize that the science fathers, the founders of the scientific disciplines are overwhelmingly Christians from modern chemistry to modern quantum mechanics? These are founders, are, the science fathers are Christians. We dominate the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th century. And we have continued all the way through to the, to the uh, complete reconstruction of the uh, human genome to quantum mechanics. We've owned the scientific disciplines. We have won more Nobel Prizes in science than every other group combined times three. Yet they think we're science deniers. From just the science fathers and their personal journals, you can reconstruct the entire story of Jesus in more detail than you can reconstruct it from the church fathers. That's right. You get more information from the science fathers of history than from the church fathers. That's how much we've dominated the sciences. And by the way, every modern university descends from Christian universities. We, we built the first three in Bologna and Paris and Oxford. Top 15 universities in the world today were still founded by Christ followers. Every other group Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, Jewish people, put their universities together, multiply by 10, you're still not at how many universities have been founded by Christians. We've dominated the sciences, we've dominated education. And we also dominate religion. Because if you look at every other religion, they all hat tip Jesus. You'll find Jesus on the pages of the Quran. You'll find Jesus on the pages of Ahmadi Muslim scripture, on Baha'i scripture, from the mouths of Buddhist leaders, Hindu leaders. Everyone loves Jesus in world religions. While Jesus says, no, sorry, I'm the only way. So just from non-Christian religions, you can reconstruct all the data about Jesus. How can that be so? How can it be that this guy is world's most important person of interest? How can that be? You, by the way, this cannot be said. What I just told you about literature, art, music, education, science, and world religions cannot be said about any other historical figure. It's unique to Jesus of Nazareth. This is the guy whose impact is felt everywhere. How can that be the case? Given who he was. Let me just remind you of all the other people who were in the first century. These folks ruled nations. They ruled armies. They were, had great educations. They were globally powerful. 
None of them matter anymore. None of them. These are the people who ruled nations. Historically, epic leaders. None of them matter anymore. These are the people who said they were God or spoke for God. None of them matter like Jesus. These are the other people who said they were the Jewish Messiah. Did you even know there were other people who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah? Until about the 13th century. Here they are. You don't know their names because they don't matter. It's just Jesus who matters. How can that be? Well, maybe, and think about it. This is the guy who, born in one small little nowhere town and raised in another small little nowhere town, only has three years to get it done, only travels about 200 miles from start to finish. This is a guy who had no family structure. The people who had power and were religious, they either hunted or persecuted him. His friends denied him. He didn't have the kind of education most have. He didn't have a family structure that would even allow, he had no wife, he had no kids to carry on his legacy. He didn't have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. How do you build a platform without that stuff? He didn't have any of that stuff. Instead, he was falsely accused, brutally beaten, humiliated, and had no, and no support. The people who said, I'll be with you to the end, they just denied him and left him. And then when it's all said and done, they had to put his body in a borrowed grave. This is the guy who changes everything. How can that even be? Well, maybe it's just that I mean, don't you see how this, look, let's look at it this way. If there's not another, if there's no fictional character in the history of fictional characters who's had this kind of impact on literature, art, music, education, science, and world religions. There isn't any. Can you think of one? Is it Luke Skywalker? Is it Peter Pan? I mean, who is it? There isn't anyone. And if there isn't anyone, then it's a good inference that he's something other than a fictional character. Well, there's no other living human who's had this kind of impact. Who is it? There isn't anyone. So there's a good inference that he's something more than just another living human. Do you see how this demonstrates something about his historicity and something about his deity? This is just the, the nature of this. This is a decent, we're starting to build this case. Do you see where we're, where we're going? And it turns out this might conf this actually make sense because he spoke as though he was something other than a person. Look, the prophets would say, uh, the Lord your God says, the Lord Almighty says, the Lord our God says. Jesus never does that. He never starts a sentence that way. Jesus says, I say to you. The prophets spoke for God. Jesus always speaks as God. There is a difference. And it's not just that. He says, you know what? We come from the same place. He, was, he says, hey, we, I, that stuff that only belongs to God, it belongs to me. Like angels. He, he, he actually claims equality with God. I mean, you think about this for a second. If you're a human in the first century, you're Jewish, and you actually, someone tries to worship you as a human, you're going to stop them because that's blasphemy. Peter meets Cornelius. Cornelius drops on his legs, on his knees to worship Peter. Peter says, get up. I'm a human. You don't worship me. Jesus never rejects the worship offered to him. And it happens over and over and over again. Not only that, he uses the name of God. He has the power, the authority to create. Who does that but God? He has the authority to forgive. Who does that but God? He has the authority to grant eternal life, to judge the living from the dead. Who has that but God? This is why in the end, I think our young people need to know that Jesus is not a person of interest. He's the God of the universe. Who should, I hope, be interesting to them. Look at the three choices. Um, a fictional character could change the world this way. Mm. A human born in this small little pocket of the Roman Empire in the first century could change the world in this way. Mm. God, though, entering into his creation could have this expected impact on the world. Which of those three options makes more sense to you? So it's man, it's myth, or it's Messiah. And Messiah makes more sense to me. So what we're going to do. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to say to you, I'm going to send you stuff I promised I will send you. And I wasn't even going to do this, but then I saw you were already texting to get information on the screen. So I already know you guys can do this. So I'm going to text you a bunch of stuff from our website, which is just coldcasechristianity.com. And here's how you're going to get it. If you missed anything you want to go deeper, you're just going to text the word detective to this number. I know it's got a lot of sixes, okay? I didn't pick that number, all right? 
That's just the number I got, okay? So just follow those directions and we'll send it all to you. Now, now look, even in a church like this, and I'm in Los Angeles County, so it's a little bit different. But I'll bet there are people here who have been coming because your spouse keeps on dragging you to church. And you were raised in the church. But you've never even looked at it evidentially to think if it's true. I'm not a Christian because I was raised in the church. Because I wasn't raised in the church. I'm not a Christian because I was hoping to change my life. I had a great life. My wife and I were together for 18 years before we became Christians. I'm just a Christian because it's true. And I can demonstrate it's true. And for our young people, we have to be able to demonstrate. Now, if you're in this room and you're thinking, yeah, I've never considered it that way. Wouldn't you rather be in an inconvenient truth than in a convenient lie? Today's the day. But sometimes I think what we have to deal with when we're in a very well-churched part of the country is, is apathy or a sense in which this is a part of my culture, but it doesn't govern my everyday thoughts. Because I haven't really... You can make a better case for why the Razorbacks should be winning that game than we can for why Christianity is true. I can tell you why they should sign OBJ at the Rams. We just won the Super Bowl. I, I, I got a five-point case for why we should sign Beckham to another contract. Really? That's a wasted part of headspace I don't need to give up. If you're in this room and you have not been thinking deeply about everything that points to Jesus, that's got to stop today. If you haven't surrendered your life to the God of the universe that changed all of history, that's got to stop today. Let's talk about that, Bill.